Dante's Numbers is the seventh Nick Costa novel, a story that begins in Rome, then shifts elsewhere to America. It's a dark, twisting story about love and obsession and identity. As a writer, I steal habitually from Italy's cultural and historical heritage. This time round, the object of my rifling was Dante Alighieri, the 14th-century Florentine, who bequeathed to us one of the world's most original and disturbing works, The Divine Comedy. The work begins with these lines. Midway upon the journey of our life, I found myself within a forest dark, for the straightforward pathway had been lost. This is a voyage of discovery made by a man who's lost his way. Dante's journey is filled with a longing for his lost love, Beatrice Portinari, the girl from his native Florence who never returned his devotion and died young to Dante's constant distress. His obsession with his beloved Bice never ceases. If you look at so many of the paintings inspired by the poem, you can see a recurring image. Dante following the dead Bice, always looking, always longing, with an almost psychotic devotion. It's almost as if, in modern terms, she's some kind of movie star. Books need worlds, and for this book I wanted a world shaped by Dante, yet familiar to us too. I didn't have to look far. If you walk above the Spanish steps in Rome, you find yourself in the park of the Villa Borghese. It's a beautiful place, with lovely views across the Tiber to the Vatican. The area is best known for the Galleria Borghese, the astonishing art collection inside the villa itself. But as always with Rome, there's more to see if you wander off the beaten track. In a little clearing in the woods, you'll find a tiny wooden hut called the Cinema dei Piccoli. This movie theatre for children was built in 1934 with just 63 seats and is, according to the Guinness Book of Records, the smallest cinema in the world, and who would argue with them? Just around the corner from the Cinema dei Piccoli, you'll find something more modern for the grown-ups. Rome's film centre, the Casa del Cinema. Italians, you see, adore the fantasy world of movies, just as they adore the fantasy world of Dante. Romance, comedy, adventure, grotesque and bizarre horror flicks, jallies such as Dario Argento's Suspiria, and of course everything that Hollywood produces, they devour them all. So here is the world that's the starting point for Dante's numbers. In the book, a legendary Italian horror director has come out of retirement to make a big budget CGI film blockbuster of Dante's Inferno. He has an all-star Hollywood cast, a world premiere planned for the gardens outside the Casa del Cinema, then a transfer to America where the movie is expected to be one of the summer's big hits. Something terrible happens. Two of the stars are attacked. The glittering occasion disintegrates into violence and confusion. For Nick Costa and his colleagues, the case takes on an infuriating dimension as they are sidelined from the principal inquiry and told to investigate a subsidiary case, the disappearance of the death mask of Dante Alighieri, which was on show for the premiere. Not that they're in agreement about how to proceed. Is the movie of Inferno being stalked by someone outraged that a pulp director has tackled one of the greatest pieces of Italian literature? Or is the perpetrator driven by more prosaic desires? Revenge over a dubious financial deal, even an obsession with the movie's beautiful and iconic Hollywood star, Maggie Flavier. Dante's Numbers was diverted from the customary path of a Costa novel by a very unexpected real-life experience. Just before I was due to begin writing this book, I was invited to a mystery writers conference at the famous Book Passage store in Corte Madera, which is just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. Now, I had no idea what to expect in Corte Madera, certainly no clue that I'd find myself sharing the main event stage with Martin Cruz Smith, one of my personal heroes, because without Gorky Park, I wouldn't be writing what I do today. The conference lasted four exhausting and exhilarating days, days that left my head full of unanswered questions about writing, about what kind of book to work on next. And afterwards, I, I fell into an apartment in San Francisco for a week to finish the sixth Nick Costa book, The Garden of Evil, 
when I wasn't working on that, I walked the streets. Now this isn't tourist San Francisco, the slightly cheesy bustle of Union Square and Fisherman's Wharf. I was staying near the marina in an area with the unlikely name of Cow Hollow. It had a Mediterranean feel and the atmosphere of a village, very like parts of Rome in places. It even looked like Rome. The Palace of Fine Arts, for example, with its wrecked columns and genteel beauty by a lake, was designed to resemble a ruin from a Piranesi sketch of Italy. All of which made me think, what would Nick and his colleagues make of a world like this, one both familiar and strange at the same time? Something else clicked in San Francisco too, something that took me back to the world of movies and finally provided the key into Dante that I'd been hunting. The more time I spent in the city, the more I remembered a movie that I must have first seen when I was a teenager. It's a strange, compulsive, impenetrable movie, Hitchcock's Vertigo, which is shot in San Francisco 50 years ago. When I was in Cow Hollow, I picked up a DVD of Vertigo and watched it at home. Then I bought a couple of books about the movie and wandered around the city trying to locate the places where it had been shot. A few are entirely different, but a lot, the Palace of Fine Arts, the Legion of Honour, haven't changed very much at all. The world of Vertigo is still very much alive in 21st century California, if you go looking for it. Mission Dolores, one of the original Catholic missions to California, now part of a busy residential district, struck me in particular. Vertigo is the story of Scotty, the former detective who becomes obsessed with a troubled character called Madeline Elster. She, in turn, is consumed by thoughts of a dead Spanish woman, Carlotta Valdez, whose spirit, Madeline believes, is coming to possess her. There's a wonderfully spooky scene in the movie where Madeline visits Carlotta's grave in the old Mission Dolores Cemetery. If you go there today after watching Vertigo, this very old, very calm spot in the midst of the modern city can still send shudders down your spine. The more I thought about Vertigo, the more it seemed to mesh in with the story I wanted to write. Scotty's obsession with the doomed Madeleine Elster is visual in a way that only Hitchcock could achieve. All those long shots of Jimmy Stewart in his car tracking her green Jaguar through the still familiar streets of the city. Scotty's quest too seemed to me to reflect the heart of Dante's poem. The elusive ghostly figure of Madeleine mirrors that of Beatrice Portinari. Scotty, like Dante, is someone who's lost midway on the journey of life, trapped inside a dark forest with the straightforward pathway lost. In my book, these twin stories begin to collide and meld and give Nick Costa a very personal challenge, quite unlike anything he's ever met in Rome. That challenge lies in the character of Maggie Flavier, the actress he finds himself drawn towards as he fights to come to terms with the personal loss he suffered in the previous book. Maggie, like Madeleine Elster, hovers between reality and myth. It's no coincidence that whenever she wants to create a character for a new part, she goes to the Legion of Honor and stares at the portraits on the walls for inspiration. In Vertigo, of course, this is the very place where Madeline encounters the unforgettable portrait of the dead Carlotta Valdez. In a way, Dante's Numbers is a kind of ghost story. It's about people who are haunted by the past, their own, that of others, and also the visceral power of a great movie that shapes the way we see the enclosed world of a city just as powerfully as any great book does. This was a fascinating book to write, and it's one that's quite different in tone and scope to anything else I've ever done. But San Francisco is not home to my characters, so for the next book, they will be back in Rome, somewhere they feel they belong. They'll be a little older, perhaps a little wiser for their experiences in California. Who knows? If you'd like to see what some of the places in this book look like, please check out the picture galleries on davidhewson.com. I remember that if you sign up for our newsletter, you could win a signed first edition of this or a future Costa book too. This was David Hewson talking to you about Dante's Numbers, the seventh Nick Costa novel. Thanks for taking the time to stop by and good day.